Library. I want to welcome you to tonight's program, the final one in the five-part Crime Con series, which we bring to you in partnership with the New York chapter of the Mystery Writers of America. We've been working together for several years in person when we were able to do so, and this year virtually, which has given us the added benefit of making these programs accessible to a much wider audience. More than, 200 pe more than 250 people have either attended the live program or watched the recording on our YouTube channel. It's also given us the ability to present wonderful authors who would not otherwise be able to make the trip to Stanford. The series is underwritten by the Friends of the Ferguson Library who, su who support all of the library's programs primarily through the sale of used books in their bookshop. So if you're in Stanford, please come by, we're open, and find the wonderful books written by the authors who've been a part of this series. If you can't find them there, visit our other very long-standing partner, independent bookseller, Elm Street Books in New Canaan, who'd be happy to serve you. Introducing tonight's program is MWA member Tom Straw. Connecticut writer Tom Straw is an Emmy-nominated TV producer and author of seven New York Times bestsellers under the pen name Richard Castle. He still writes and produces TV, most recently Showtime's Nurse Jackie, and also serves on the national board of the Mystery Writers of America. Please enjoy tonight's program. Tom, take it away. Thank you, Susan, and everyone at the Ferguson Library in Stanford. For years, the Ferguson Library has been a terrific venue for CrimeCon's annual in-person panels, and now they've topped themselves by setting it up so the Mystery Writers of America New York, Connecticut chapter can go virtual. Tonight, in our fifth and final program in this series, we're honored to be in the company of two exceptional authors. One broke ground 30 years ago. One broke out this summer. One is a cultural icon delivering the goods from a mountaintop one is a hot newcomer writing his name in donuts on blacktop. One is Walter Mosley, the author of more than 60 critically acclaimed books, including fiction, literary, mystery, and science fiction, political monographs, writing guides, including elements of fiction, a memoir in paintings, and a young adult novel called 47. His work has been translated into 25 languages. From a forthcoming collection of short stories, The Awkward Black Man, to his daring novel, John Woman, which explored deconstructionist history, and his standalone crime novel, Down the River and Unto the Sea, which won an Edgar Award for Best Novel, the rich storylines Walter Mosley has created deepen the understanding and appreciation of black life in the United States. He has introduced an indelible cast of characters into the American canon, starting with his first novel, Devil in a Blue Dress, which brought private detective Easy Rollins and his friends Jackson Blue and Raymond Mouse Alexander into readers' lives. Mr. Mosley was inducted into the New York State Writers Hall of Fame, and he's a winner of numerous awards, including an O. Henry Award, a Grammy, several NAACP Image Awards, and Pan America's Lifetime Achievement Award. In 2020, he was named the recipient of the Robert Kirsch Award for Lifetime Achievement from Los Angeles Times Festival of Books. And let us not overlook, in 2016, Walter Mosley received the Mystery Writers of America's Grand Master Award. S.A. Cosby is a writer from Southeastern Virginia. His short fiction has appeared in numerous anthologies and magazines. His short story, The Grass Beneath My Feet, won the Anthony Award for Best Short Story in 2019. He's also the author of My Darkest Prayer and Brotherhood of the Blade. His latest novel, Blacktop Wasteland, just went into its seventh printing, and it's also being adapted as a motion picture. Mr. Cosby's writing is influenced by his experience as a bouncer, construction worker, retail manager, and for six whole hours, a mascot for a major fast food chain inside the world's hottest costume. <laughs> when he isn't crafting tales of murder and mayhem, he assists the dedicated staff at J.K. Redmond Funeral Home as a mortician's assistant. He's an avid hiker and is also known as one hell of a chess player. To lead our conversation with our guests and to share your questions is Chris Knopf, who has published 17 mystery, uh, mysteries and thrillers receiving multiple awards and starred reviews.
Chris's short stories and essays have appeared in Alfred Hitchcock, Ellery Queen, Mystery Writers Journal, Crime Spree, Deadly Pleasures, and the Akashic Noir series. Chris spent 45 plus years in advertising and also contributes to nonfiction publications. Chris, good luck finding something to talk about with these two. <laughs> I'll try, we'll figure it out. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Uh, well, I'm honored to have you guys here to talk to. It's really a pleasure. Um, I want to get right into it. Uh, my first question, uh, family plays a really big role in your your books. Uh, Walter, I, the last one I read of yours was the one that's coming out in February, Blood mm -hmm. Grove. Mm -hmm. So it was very, a lot of strong family references and the connection between Easy and his, and his, his daughter and and Sean, your 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 book also it's it's a fundamental it's a core principle of your work. Uh, Beauregard's relationship with his with his wife and his kids. <clears throat> so to what the, you know, and you both had really interesting upbringings and really interesting uh, childhoods. Could you just kind of tell me to what extent you sort of mine your own childhoods and your own that experience, and how much of that that do you convey to your characters? Can I start with Walter? Uh, By all means, please. <laughs> <laughs> Gives you time to uh, think. <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's an interesting question. You know, I'm an only child. My mother was an only child. My father was an orphan. Both of them are dead. I have no family now. Uh, I have no children, you know, as they say, as I know of. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I, I really think... Probably, yeah. You know, I mean, I, I'm usually not asked these questions, and I, so I'm usually not thinking about it. Uh, but, but probably, my notions of family are, are kind of unconscious desires that come out inside my novels. Uh, uh, Leonid McGill and his and his uh, kids. Uh, his wife says they're all his, but he knows only one of them is. Uh, but he loves them anyway. Uh, you know, Easy Rollins, who, you know, just finds, you know, uh, abandoned children and brings them in, raises them uh, uh, for, for, for a reason. And I think that Easy's reasoning for that is about as unconscious as mine. It's not, it, it, it's, it's like, you know, my father used to tell me, he said, you know, when, when he was a, a kid in, in, in uh, Texas, Louisiana, in, in the earlier part of the 20th century, um, they didn't have adoptions and orphans because if a kid was on his own, some family just brought the kid in. They said, well, okay, you, you need someplace. So uh, you sit down at the end of the table and you milk the cow and that's it. You know, that's, that's what, that's what happened. And, and it's funny because it's not a, it's, it's not a, it's, it's not a, a plot. It's, it's not a, a, a part of a story. Uh, I mean, it is because it's part of Easy's life and Leonid's life and other characters. But um, it's 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 just the design of of these characters' lives. Thank you, sir. Sean, yeah. I think um, it's funny the the uh, the opposite end of the spectrum. I have a brother. I my mom had uh, five brothers and sisters. My dad. Had eleven brothers and sisters. I have more cousins than I can count. I, that's why I had to go out of town to date because everybody I'm related to everybody in my county, so I had to leave. Uh, but um, family and the family dynamics are fundamentally important in my my writing because nobody knows you as well as your family, and nobody can slide the knife between your ribs the way your family can, metaphorically or in some cases literally and so the bonds of family the weight of the responsibility that comes with being a father or a brother or just being the de facto matriarch or patriarch of a family i, I can see their through lines in all my writing in, in darkest prayer and in my fantasy novel brother of the blade and of course especially in black top wasteland in my upcoming novel razor blade tears the amount of connectivity that exists within a family and how you go about doing your best to hold those things together. You know, sometimes trying to hold a family together is like, you know, trying to hold on to a wet bar of soap. The tighter you squeeze, the harder it's trying to get away. And so I think that comes from my childhood. My mother and father separated when I was young. 
Um, the first four years or five years of my life are a bad country song. My mom and dad broke up, our house burned down, and my mom had a partial stroke. And so we had to move in with my grandparents. And, uh, you know, I didn't get, I didn't have indoor plumbing until I was 16. But as abject <clears throat> as our poverty was, you know, it, our love for each other and our, our, our connections with each other were as strong in the, in the opposite, you know, uh, Again, like I said, I had so many cousins and relatives and, you know, my whole little neighborhood was people that I knew. And so I've seen the beauty of that and I've seen how that can sometimes be painful and how you're weighted down by expectations of your family tree. And so those are things that have definitely consciously and subconsciously slithered into my writing. Yeah, that's very clear in that book that you both sides of what it's like to have a, a family and it's sometimes the best and sometimes the worst of what you have to live with. Sean, I wanted to ask you, I mean, I, I, I worked on cars when I was a kid. I, you know, when I was a teenager and a young man and I'm old enough that when my contemporary world was hot rods, <laughs> dusters and Chevelles and SS and vets and, yeah. and all that stuff. So was that, is that your experience or where'd you get all that for your book? Cause it is, it is fantastic. Yes. So I grew up, as I said, in a small town, the smallest, smallest county in Virginia. And so growing up, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, date myself here, growing up, we didn't have cable. We didn't have a lot to do. And so all those cousins that I knew loved to work on cars. So they would soup up, <laughs> like you said, Chevelles and Mavericks and, and Impalas and the odd gremlin every once in a while. And um, we would just go out to the far end of the county and drag race. And I wasn't supposed to be going. I, I, was, I can remember being 12 or 13 and sneaking out and jumping, like sneaking out and <laughs> sneaking out and not wearing my shoes so I wouldn't make any noise going down the steps and then jumping in the car with my cousin and going out to the foreign county and drag racing. And, you know, sometimes it was just for fun. Sometimes it was for money. Sometimes it was pretty serious. But I always held on to those memories because there was such an incredible amount of camaraderie in those times. You know, growing up in a time where you know, being an African-American man in a small southern town is not the most pleasant experience sometimes. And so those nights out there, you know, those summer nights on that two-lane highway with, you know, cornfield on each side of you, you kind of could forget that for a while. You you could just be, you know, a, a guy behind the wheel of a car. You know, freedom is just a, a burnout away, so to speak. And so that was a part of my life. And then growing up, I became a passable shade tree mechanic because you know we, we were poor my mom worked part-time so when we when our car broke down I, i've literally learned I, i've literally used a pair of pantyhose for a fan belt so <laughs> I, I learned those you know those um, a part of you know the the you know necessity is the mother of ingenuity of, of invention and poverty is the mother of ingenuity and so that's always been a part of me even today i, I don't own any muscle cars or anything like that but one of my dreams is to buy a um, either a 71 Impala or a, um, or a Barracuda and fix it up. And so that's always been a part of my lexicon. And also, one more thing I'll say before I finish. Also, I grew up um, watching uh, movies that were what, I guess, for lack of a better word, were called redneck noir. So I grew up watching Gator and White Lightning and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Rum Run, uh, Moon Runners and uh, Crazy Larry, Dirty Mary, that whole 70s, 80s period of, you know, where directors were like, hey, we got a bunch of cars. Let's see how fast they go before we wreck them and smoking the band <laughs> and all of that. And so that also had a huge impact on me as a, as a, as a young man and as a writer. So that was definitely a part of my uh, part mm -hmm. of my past, so to speak. We're lucky we're alive, actually. Um, <laughs> Walter, uh, yeah. <laughs> radical switch of gears. I mean, you, you've written everything, as far as I can tell. There's nothing, there's no genre or classification of literature that you haven't delved into and published and been acclaimed at doing. Can you kind of rate the different uh, difficulties or between these different types of writing, I mean, novels versus short stories, nonfiction, screenwriting, I mean, do you find one much harder than the other, or are you really happy when you get to write in a, one of these different classifications? What do you think? It's so interesting. I mean, I, I don't, you know, the other day, you know, 
it, it, I mean, anybody, anybody who knows me knows that, that, that my, my argument is that if you don't understand poetry, you don't have to be able to write poetry, but if you don't understand poetry, you can't write fiction because poetry has all of the tools for, for great fiction, for, you know, great prose at any rate. And, uh, but you know, I've never been able to, to write a poem. I just, I just couldn't do it. I just can't do it. And the other day I got a call uh, from Ishmael Reed. And Ishmael is, you know, has, is, is publishing this magazine and the magazine they're gonna cover Black Lives Matter. And he says, I would like something from you very short to kind of put in the magazine. And, and I, I wrote back to him and I said, so Ishmael, what do you want? I mean, like, okay, something short, like what? I mean, and he goes, and he, and he waited a couple of days and he sent me a, a thing and he says, uh, Walter, uh, why don't you uh, write a sonnet? You know, you have some rhythm in your language, write a sonnet. And, and it was funny because I, I went, oh, okay, because I've never written like structured poetry like that. And I said, well, you know, Ishmael said do it, so I guess I'll do it. And it worked. And, and I realized for the first time ever that the structure that, that the sonnet offers allowed me to write this poem about this political subject. And that was fantastic. I was so happy. I was happy to be working on it. I was happy that it worked. I, you know, I called up, you know, listen, I was very worried. I called up Nikki Finney, one, one of America's great poets. And I said, Nikki, you want to look at this thing? Because, you know, I don't know. And she <laughs> wrote me back and said, well, you need three commas and to change uh, to sleep to us sleep. <laughs> and it works. And I went, OK. And you know, because Nick, Nikki's great. She won the you know, National Book Award for uh, for her uh, her book of poetry a few years ago, and and I and I think in a way that's an answer to your thing about genre, because it's what it's what works. I'm always interested in what works, how to get there. Uh, things are different. Uh, novels are the easiest thing to write, as Ian e. Forster says in Aspects of the Novel. Uh, a novel is 50,000 words, more or less, of spongy prose, you know? Uh, short stories are crystalline prose, and, and poems and, and plays are diamond prose. Um, so, you know, if, if you want to be successful at something, uh, you know, I, I suggest starting off with a novel. But, um, but as far as genres are concerned, um, how they fit me is is what I'm going to be doing. If I, if I want to write about the soul, for instance, I'm not going to write a mystery, you know, uh, I'm going to have to find another genre to, you know, to, to see me through. Um, but so I don't, I don't think anyone is any harder than anything else, but, but they're, they're all useful and functional and, and, and kind of happenstance also. Well, you know, when you, you bring up poetry and literature, I, you know, uh, readers, kind of uh, obsess about writers lives i mean they always the readers always want to know mm -hmm. how we get through the day and what our process is and all that stuff and but you know in my experience hanging out with writers the writers obsess over things like craft and and the structure and and the publishing deal that they that just screwed them or or just <laughs> made their day <laughs> you know not we ever complain about our publishers we love them <laughs> but um uh you know but the other thing is, you know, we're you're, we're literary people, and you guys both really express tremendous amount of erudition in your work, although it's sometimes very slyly fit in, sometimes more overt. So I ask you about your family histories and so forth, and how that influenced you. What about your reading? What about your you know your your love of literature? And you know, Sean, what 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 drove you as a as a young person, and that you think might have driven you into being a writer? I think the best thing that ever happened to me as a writer, um, we, again, going back to my childhood, we live way out in the country. So everything is, you know, unlike living in the city, everything is 45 minutes away and it's impossible to get to if you don't have a car. And so I, as much as I love the library, a lot of times I couldn't get there, but there used to be a, a secondhand store very close to my house and they had this big shopping cart full of paperbacks. And you could go in there and you could get five paperbacks for a dollar, but there was no rhyme or reason 
you know, you might pick up an Ellery Queen, you know, uh, you know, the 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 adventure of the Spanish Key, mm-hmm. and you might turn around and pick up, you know, uh, something by Leon Uris, you know, uh, or you might pick up, you know, Dorothy L. Sayers, a uh, Peter Whimsey novel, and then search around and pull out Soul on Ice by Elridge Cleaver. And so I had this incredibly, incredibly eclectic uh, 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 background as far as reading these paperbacks. And because, you know, I, I was kind of a nerdy kid. We didn't have, like I said, we only had three channels. So, and I didn't have a vote. I read a lot. And so I would buy all these different types of books that didn't have anything to do with each other. And so that was where I first started reading about Agatha Christie, but it was also where I got a book of... Um, by, uh, Shakespeare's Sonnets and and uh, you know the work like poetry by you know, like Dylan Thomas and, and Ezra Pound and you know and so I didn't know at 13 or 14 that this was more advanced than I should be reading I didn't know I wasn't supposed to be reading this I was just like oh this is pretty cool I like this cover so I'm going to take it home and read and so those books gave me a really strong foundation as far as like what literature I like and what I saw in those books that I like that worked And then when I got older and going to high school, I had a teacher named Mr. Bone, who was my 11th grade English teacher. And uh, he was the first person to really point out to me. He said, you know, I think you have a a certain voice for writing. I think you can do it. And he would give me like books like, you know, Dostoevsky and and, and stuff by Chekhov and and, and some more experimental stuff, you know, uh, know, uh, like Last Exit of Brooklyn by Hubert Selby. And so all of that. And then on my own, I started finding the work of like Iceberg Slim and Chester Himes and, uh, uh, you know, Richard Wright, and even Donald Goins and stuff like that. And so by the time I started writing, all of that was just swirling around in my head. And so you take a book like Black Top Wasteland, I'll have a scene where somebody's, you know, um, getting a wrench shoved down their throat. But I'll also have a, a line in there about, you know, uh, sparks flying up from the road like a, 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 you know, a tidal wave made of falling stars because all of that became a part of my lexicon, my syntax. And even now, I love reading just about anything. I don't have any particular genre that I stick to. You know, I don't just read crime novels. I mean, I just finished this um, The Secret History by Donna Tartt, which is amazing. It's incredible. It takes 10 years to write a book, but damn, if everyone ain't a masterpiece. And so, uh, yeah, that poor kid that had to buy paperbacks for five bucks, I mean, for a, for a dollar, it became a foundation. And then also my mom, my mom loved Greek mythology. So she had all these books about Greek mythology flying around the house. So I'm reading about, Nefer, you know, uh, uh, you know about, about Zeus and, and Hera and, and, and how Zeus can't keep it in his pants and all that. And um, my grandmother, God bless her soul, she loved Harlequin romances. So I was reading everything from Harlequin romances to true story, pulp fictions to, you know, like I said, the work of um, George Eliot. So, yeah, uh, being poor was in that instance was kind of a, a, a it was kind of a help for me because I just kind of read whatever I could have get my hands on. I love that, uh, Walter. You you famously talk about being a single kid and you know and spend a lot of time on your own so i'm imagining to some degree your experience is a lot like sean's in that you're you're you like to dive into books when you were a young person uh yeah i mean and it's so interesting to me the 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 notion of you know like i didn't think about being a writer until i was in my mid-30s i'd i'd read i'd read books you know i don't know if i've read a lot of books but i would read books and I really enjoyed them. Uh, and, you know, it, it is a great, you know, when you're a kid, because you do think of all kinds of things and, and you can go in any direction. Um, but I, I, I see such a, a difference between writing and reading. I think both of them are incredibly important. Um, reading most importantly, because, you know, this, it's, a, it's a way that people learn how to think, how to define themselves, how to redefine what you're being told into something else. I mean, it's, it's really very complex and very beautiful. Uh, but reading doesn't make anybody a writer. You know, I mean, you know, I, I have all kinds of friends who have read circles around me. Um, but they're not writers and they don't want to be writers. And, you know, I, you know and to some degree, can't be to, you know to, to the level that they would like to, um, and 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 I and I try to keep those those things uh, going. 
in my head. Hey, can you still hear me? Yep, I, I yes. can hear you fine. Yeah. I can't I can't see you at all, but yes, okay. Uh, that's that's good. I, I'm just there. for a minute you disappeared. All right, I'm back. Um, <laughs> Because the screen just went completely blank, so so I I think that that you know a writer has a story to tell, and it's a it's a big problem if the writer is only interested in writing and writers writing, because what happens is that the writer ends up writing about writers writing, and that's as a rule uninteresting. Yeah, a couple I of people have gotten away with it, but uh, and so. Uh, you know, I, I hardly ever think of reading and writing like at, at the same moment, you know. When it comes to writing, I think of rereading because I'm writing something. But uh, I, don't, I don't think about, about the books that I've read or, or, or how they've impacted me. And I think it's true for everybody. Every person who reads a book creates that book when they read it. You know, and, 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 when, and when you're experiencing the world, like if I'm gonna write about uh, uh, racial equality uh, in the United States, or I'm going to write uh, some real uh, adventure about a, a detective or or an alien in some far flung future. Uh, that's 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 me trying to get at something, and um, and even if it comes from other books I've read, it's also comes from television shows I've had, people I've met, times I've been stopped by the police, times I've seen you know somebody get beaten on the street. I mean. All of those things have, have like uh, really equally powerful impact on people, on me anyway. Uh, you know, the, again, I'm, I'm going to go switch into another extreme position, but, uh, <laughs> you know, there's a cliche, another writer's writerly cliche, which we've heard a million times is uh, setting and place being like a character. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true for a lot of writers, but a lot of times, no, it could, these stories could have been told anywhere. But the last two books that I've read from you guys, uh, your, your next uh, Easy Rollins book, Walter, and, and Blacktop Wasteland, place really is hugely important to your story. It doesn't, I can't imagine Easy, you know, going through what he went through in any place other than LA. Uh, so, could you talk to that? I mean, do you agree with that, or do you feel like you could drop him into Detroit or, or into Paris, and he'd be the same kind of experience? Sean, <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, for this particular character, for Beauregard, the main character, Black Tie Wasteland, Beauregard Montage, I think the setting and the narrative are inexorably in tied together, and. Um, you, I could take Beauregard and take him to New York and drop him on 46th Street and have him go into a Peter Dillon's bar and get a get a Jameson, but it would be a totally different story. I think he wouldn't change so much, but the narrative around him would change. It's just like throwing a rock into a pond. It, 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 the ripples would be diff of different intensity. Um, for him, the story being set where I'm from, from southeastern Virginia, being set near the Chesapeake Bay, there's a certain amount of I would say intrinsic narrative that has to happen there. You you're gonna be on long, you know, desolate two lane highways. You're gonna go to a small little bar that's just barely more than a juke joint. Even in 2015 or 2016, when the book is set, um, so there's certain things that are gonna be that are inescapable if because they're set where they're set. But for instance, like I said, if I take Bogart and I take him to L.A. and he's gonna plan a heist out there everything is going to be different about the narrative except Beauregard because he's going to still be the character as that I envision hopefully um so but for me setting is huge it's I wouldn't say it's a character but it's definitely helped shape the narrative and an atmosphere is also and those are two different things I think I think setting and atmosphere are distinctly different and I think uh, when they both work in concert really well I like to write I, my writing is re really sensory driven. So I talk a lot of, I, I've actually gotten a couple one and two star reviews for this, but I talk a lot about smells and scents and feels and sweat and heat and, and, and tactile sensation. And that's just the way I am. I just, yep. that's just the way I like to write, but it would be different if it was in a different setting. Uh, but I, I, it's funny because when I first read Devil in Blue Dress, 
even though Easy Rollins was in LA in the 50s, I felt a very strong kinship with him because he talked about coming from, you know, Texas and that Texas, Arkansas, uh, border, borderland. And, you know, some of the things that he was talking about growing up in the 30s or 40s or whenever his time period is, they were very much similar to what I was going through in the 80s in Virginia. As I like to say, we used to watch uh, Sounder on TV and it wasn't a movie, it was a documentary. So uh, <laughs> I'll throw it back to Walter, but it's, I definitely think that has a, a strong uh, aspect to the narrative. You know, place is always important. So if you look, wrote a novel, you know, it, this is really true in movies. I mean, you, you get that, Chris, right? When you get a story set in one place and then you have to reimagine it somewhere else or depending on what the budget is, where you're going to shoot, how, what, what's going to happen. Um, but, but the translation there always becomes place is important where you are. So, you know, I write, you know, I've, I've written detective novels about Easy Rollins. He's in Los Angeles, you know, in the 50s, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, like that. Uh, then Leonid McGill, he's in New York in the 21st century. Um, they do a lot of the same things. They, they respond a lot to the world in, 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 in similar ways. But once the novel is written, the place is absolute. You know, it has to be a place, no matter where you're going to put it. And, uh, and so, and you know, I've written about a lot of different places in the, in the past, like as far back as, you know, the, the early 19th century and in the future as, you know, far ahead as the maybe 30th century. Uh, but once you get there, you have to be able to define that place in an absolute way. And the reader reading it has to believe in that place in that way. Uh, well, speaking of the different generations, uh, you know, uh, E.C. Rollins, uh, living in the 50s and the 60s in L.A., you know, he's he's dealing with some horribly naked, overt sort of racism mm -hmm. that that is, you know, unabashed and un, unalloyed. Uh, and at the same time, Beauregard Montage is dealing with racism, but it's got a different little different texture to it because it's 2015. I mean, there are differences, mm -hmm. but at the same time, Having read both those, your you guys' books in a row, there's an awful lot of similarities too, in in, in a tragic <laughs> way. Uh, could could you all kind of could you address that? I mean, especially Walter, since you're yeah, well, you're you know you're not you're not quite as young as we are, but uh, <laughs> maybe you could give you know your perspective of a guy <laughs> who's been around a little longer about his experience, you know, these different eras, both as a writer and as a black man. The thing that I like, you know, because, you know, I'm writing about, you know, uh, my people, you know, I mean, and, and I assume Sean is too. And so, and, but, and, 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 you know, you, you could write a book and say, well, I'm writing, you know, uh, you know, uh, a kind of a, a, a social, uh, a social drama of, of the impact between different cultures, whatever. But the truth is, if you go, you turn over and you say, "Well, I'm, I'm right. I'm right now. I'm going to be writing a mystery." The great thing about writing a mystery is that people read the mystery for the mystery. They really don't care that much who who, who the detective is, as long as they can identify with that detective mm -hmm. and and kind of feel what that that you know that, that's you know solution to the problem is going to be. And so, one of the wonderful things about this is writing about a certain kind of character, a black character in Los Angeles at, at some time, let's say, um, and also writing a detective mystery about that person, you get all these readers who understand him, in this case, you know, what I'm writing about, they understand him in a way uh, that, that they say, wow, you know, I understand that, I feel that. How, you know, and, they, and they say that by saying, how's he gonna get out of this? Because they understand the problem and they understand that he has to get out and they want him to get out of it, you know what I mean? And that's, I mean, that's really kind of, so the thing is, is that it goes the other way than, than saying, you know, I'm different than you. It's saying, 
I'm really the same as you. And I'm going through the same experience as you. And, you know, peop and, and people have always been going through these same experiences. And it's, so it, it, it's, it's more kind of uh, uh, bridging the gap than kind of, you know, describing it. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you describe it to some degree because you want to bridge it, but, that, but, but that's, that's the, the, the move, movement, the moment. And, you know, and it's, uh, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's, it's a great thing about, about this particular genre, about, about the crime genre. It's that every, everybody gets it, you know, and, and, and now do they get it, they want to get it. And, and that's, that's really great. Sean Houghton. For me, yeah, I mean, the thing about Blackout Wasteland is I, I wanted to talk about a certain, a few things. I, when I, you know, I'm not gonna sit here and lie and say I had some great master plan, some great, you know, uh, uh, overarching infrastructure of literature, but I did want to talk about a couple of things. I want to talk about class. I want to talk about race, poverty, tragic and toxic masculinity. I wanted to talk about, you know, the the inheritance of despair and violence. And um, but also, nobody wants to read a 300 page sermon. They, they just don't. You know, and so I wanted to write about certain things in a way that was real and authentic, but as Walter said, in a way that everybody can identify with. And so, and also <laughs> in my personal experience, modern, well, to a certain extent, modern racism is a lot more subtextual than it used to be. When I was nine or 10 years old, kid on the bus would call me an N word and you know, we would get to scrapping, that was it, you know, a nine, 10 year old kid today may not get called that, but the subtext is still there. It's no longer the N word. It's, you know, you people are so violent. You're, you know, you're, you people are so angry. It's microaggression. And so part of Black Tie Wasteland is exploring of microaggression. But like Walter said, it's also about creating characters that you identify with. So when somebody picks up the book and it's like, man, I don't think I have anything in common with this black former getaway driver, heist man, who's also a hell of a mechanic. But then you read the book and, you know, he's got a son that needs braces. He's got a daughter from a previous relationship that wants to go to college. He's got a mama that he loved, but she's mean as a rattlesnake, but he still loves her. And so <laughs> what happens is hopefully during the course of the book, whether you're a 64 year old white man from Maine or a 21 year old hipster from uh, LA, you start reading and you start identifying like, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not black and I'm not Beauregard, but man, me and my mom have had our arguments or yeah, I, I want to get a better house for my wife. I, I know those pressures. I know what it feels like to stare at, you know, your hand and decide, are you going to buy food or are you going to buy gas? And so I think it's one of those things you don't run away from it. And I don't believe in hitting people over the head with it, but at the same time, I like to address it. It's funny, uh, somebody asked me, did I think my book was timely? And I said, you know, the funny thing, I wrote this book in 2015 and things that are happening in the book and things I'm discussing, even in a subtextual way, are still happening. I don't know if the book is timely because everything that keeps happening is cyclical, unfortunately. That's, and that's the sad part. But like, again, to Walter's point, people that read the book, I've gotten really great emails from people that have nothing in common with the characters in the book, except the desperation of their situation. And that's what I I think is the aim of a good novel and a good crime novel. I'm fascinated by crime novels because I'm fascinated by desperation and how far are people willing to go. You know, I, I, I feel like, especially with crime noir, crime noir is people doing horrible things for what they believe are the right reasons. And so that is something I think that's universal. I think it translates to anyone, hopefully. I think you made it pretty clear that uh, in some ways the transcendent despair, you know, sort of crossed over racial barriers that black people were had terrible situations and in despair. And a lot of white people who were also in the same, you know, like Ronnie and Reggie, they were obviously guys who just, yeah. you know, their lives were just, were not working out. And, you know, and in some no. ways, in, in a terrible way, that was a bridge, uh, a certain empathy yeah. between them. But, you, but so, you know, exactly. there's another thing, um, you know, because, because, you know, often, you know, we, we get lost in a place where, you know, the line is drawn between races uh, and that's the line to cross and stuff like that. And, and it is, it is. But I, I find in, in writing a, a lot of uh, younger uh, 
uh, people of color come to me and say, this has really helped me understand my parents, my grandparents, uh, why this happens, why I think this, why I feel that. And then and a lot of times you find older people reading, you know, a younger writer saying, wow, I, I can really understand the problem that I had maybe with my own children or that I've had in, in my attitude toward people in my community. So I think that all that we're crossing a lot of borders. Some of them are, you know, internal to a community and some of them are, you know, intra-community. I, I've been working for years with a, uh, actually more in, in the past. He just kind of reemerged, a young black man who's, I, I, I met him in high school and I saw that he was a pretty good writer and kind of worked with him. Then he disappeared for a while and he just showed up with a manuscript <laughs> a few weeks ago. So, uh, you know, and he's not a, he's not a guy from a lot of means, you know, and he, you know, he's had a pretty rough background. What would you all recommend? I mean, would you have some advice uh, for somebody trying to come on up? He's got a book. He wrote it. He had the discipline. Uh, now he's trying to do something with it, and I'm going to try to help him. But, Sean, what do you think? I mean, what would you do? How would you? You got you to gotta get a thick skin. You got to get a thick skin, man. <laughs> um, I think that's the biggest piece of advice I give anybody because my first book uh, was published with an independent publisher uh, called My Darkest Prayer. And I t I've told the story before, but... Darkest Prayer got rejected 63 times. I know because I kept every email. And, um, you know, I, 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 it was points where I wanted to give up, but I just felt like, you know, I don't see anything out here like this. It's a detective story that the detective is kind of a troubleshooter. He's an unlicensed mixed race detective. His day job, he works at a funeral home. And um, I just kept sticking with it and it did get published. But the problem is, I think for a lot of writers, I know I can only speak for myself, but I've also, you know, I think you might get attested to this too. You know, I've also talked to writers around the bar back when we could go to conventions. And I think a lot of writers feel this, the act of writing is so personal. You know, if you, if you paint a picture and somebody doesn't like it, it's like, oh, they don't like my art. Or if you write a song and the crowd is kind of just giving you a sort of, you know, maliquitous clap, it's like, all right, well, maybe they didn't, maybe the sound system's bad, or whatever. When somebody doesn't like your book, it feels like they don't like you. And that's how I felt. <laughs> and that can be devastating. So it's like, you don't understand how long I've written this book and I've stayed up to three o'clock in the morning and I was Googling blood splatter and I, I, you know, I, I agonized over whether to use the word, you know, verdant or lush. And you don't even under, and it, it gets very personal and you have to take a step back and not take it so personal because mm -hmm. it's going to get rejected. Very few writers get that, you know, that, uh, that preempt, you know, uh, uh, manuscript uh, picked up. And so you've got to develop a thick skin because it hurts and it gets you angry and it makes you depressed. And But the thing I found for me personally, and I actually learned this at a, at a lecture that Walter gave years ago at a college in Virginia. You got to stick with it, man. You got to stick with it. If, if it's what makes you happy and it's what makes you feel like it, you're, you're, you're telling your truth, I've had a lot of jobs in my life and I haven't been really good at any of them except writing. It's the one thing I think I'm moderately good at. It's the one thing that makes me feel good, no matter what else is going on in the world in my life. So, you know, you got to get that thick skin, man. You got to build that armor up, you know, get your hit points. So <laughs> never get discouraged and never give up. That's what I always say. So, yeah. I think that's great advice, Sean. I really do. You really do got to get tough. It ain't easy. Yeah. No, that's no. very true. That's very true. That, that, you know, you have to, I mean, listen, my 52nd novel, I got 17 rejections. I was shocked. I mean, they, they just rejected me. Reject. One woman, one woman uh, uh, sent me a note and said, uh, if you want to know how to write a novel, we can get together and discuss it. I mean, <laughs> I was like, it's like, you know, if oh, I didn't do that enough, I'm sorry, no, I need to step on your head a little bit, you know, for you to understand how much we hate it. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> But I, I'm going to give a, a, a kind of like a, a, a here, here, here's something one you could reach for. Um, Thriller Fest and a couple of other, the, you know, the big meetings, uh, yeah. you know, conventions have, 
have a thing where, where you can actually join and learn how to pitch your uh, novel, learn, uh, talk to agents about novels, you know, t that, that they're, they're I, I, Thrill Fest isn't the only one who does it, but it's, it's, it's the one that, that comes to mind. And I find that extraordinarily helpful because once you start, come, get into the community of writers, if, you know, he's a writer, he wants to be a writer, he wants to send the book out. Um, the more you talk to people who make their living by writing one way or another, the more that they show you ways that, you know, if you do this, this is how that works. And if you do this, this is how this works, then you have so much of a, a better chance and you feel like you belong. You don't feel like you're just being ignored, rejected. You know, you don't walk up to the guy and say, I'm a writer and he turns around and walks off, you know? And I said, okay, well, what kind of writer? Well, you need to be over here. You need to be over there. So I, I think that there's a lot of, there, there are many organizations, very, you know, kind of yearly meetings, conventions that I think are very helpful to writers. And uh, I, I, that's where I, that's, that's what I would say. I mean, I would say the other, I mean, the, the, the most important thing, of course, is writing every day. You'd be writing every day, every day, every day, every day. There's no vacations. You know, there's no holidays, there's no weekends, you just write every day. Um, but then after that, you know, uh, learning, you know, how to have a tough skin, then all, uh, you know, there, there are uh, uh, groups out there that want to help writers be successful as writers. Find them, spend time there, examine yourself, listen to criticism in a way that doesn't feel like somebody's trying to hurt you. Uh, I, I love that advice, too, because I, when I started out, I didn't know anything about anything at all. I knew nothing about the culture. I knew nothing about the community, zero. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't believe how welcoming and helpful and supportive people are. I mean, it's, I can't wait to get back to the conventions where we can actually sit, hang out with each other again and, and talk. I mean, my God, it's the, it's, it was so wonderful to have that. And uh, I mean, wonderful people, too. I mean, great. I mean, I met some of the best people in my life, writers th at those events. Yeah, I wanted to jump on. Uh, I, I wanted to reiterate. I want to jump on something that, uh, that uh, uh, Walter said. That is really important. Finding your group, finding your gang, finding your people in writing. I, I, I'll tell a story really quick. When I first started getting I wanted to be a fantasy writer and I wrote two fantasy novels and they didn't do anything. So. I started writing crime because a friend of mine told me about a magazine called Thug Lit that needed short crime fiction stories. And I was like, you know, I've always loved crime fiction and you know, maybe I'll try it. And it just, for whatever reason, that was where I clicked at. But a guy reached out to me after being in Thug Lit, a writer named Eric Pruitt from North Carolina. And he was like, hey, you're in Virginia, I'm in North Carolina. I'm putting together a live reading. You want to come on down? Now this guy didn't know me from Adam, didn't know who I was, I could have been you know, nine feet tall and a serial killer, but he saw my story and he really liked the story and the art, the craft spoke to him in a way that was like, I want to get to know this guy. And he was one of the first people to really welcome me into the crime writing, you know, uh, 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 fraternity, sorority, what have you. And from there, I met other writers and got to be friends with other writers and editors. And so creating that net, and, you know, you can call it networking, but sometimes it's, it's it's more than that because I've made like you said I've made some really really good friends at writing conventions, sitting around a bar, sitting on a panel, walking through the lobby, um, and it makes you feel writing can be such a solitary endeavor. You know, you have your your loved ones, your girlfriend, yeah. your boyfriend, your dog, your cat. At the end of the day, it's you staring at that computer or staring at that legal pad, and to be able to have a friend who you can call up. You know, I um when, when I was writing Black Tie Wasteland, I had two friends of mine. Uh, Nikki Dolson and Kelly Garrett, uh, both writers, great writers in their own right, and, and I would call them up and be like, you want to take a look at this or read this chapter? What do you think? How do you feel about this? What are you saying here? What you, how, you know, and or just call like somebody like um friend of, like I said, my friend Eric, and and call them up and just whine. It's not going well. Ugh, I think it sucks. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. That's important. <laughs> That's important. It is. It really somebody is. that can write and get and they understand that. And I just really was sorry. I didn't mean to jump in there, but I wanted to say that it, it, it is very important to have to find that support system within the uh, industry. So anyway. Yeah, that's that's great. That's terrific advice. I got a, a questions are piling in. So I I apologize to everybody. I'm not going to be able to get to them all, of course. Uh, but one question for Marjorie, who's been very persistent, ask her. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
she's she's asking the, the question craft and hard work is really important but what about talent and that's the age old you know thing how much of it is nature how much of it is nurture how much of it are you born with and how much of it is it you can just do it by hard work i mean i don't know if we can ever answer that question but what do you well, think, listen, Walter? I mean, I mean you, can, you can have some answers. I mean, you know, um, uh, maybe uh, um, uh, Melville is a little bit more talented than uh, than uh, 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 Dickens. Uh, maybe Mark Twain isn't, isn't quite at the the level of uh, Faulkner. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> like if you're saying, you know, like the 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 real question and i i think the thing that i, I said in the lectures uh you know talking to sean all those years ago is that you know i came up with a lot of writers and the best of them quit it just so happened the best of those writers quit writing so they've never become writers because they quit writing and all these other people who weren't nearly as talented as them including myself well we're writers because we we sit and do the work uh mm -hmm. you can't i mean there's no you can't develop uh talent you know you can't you know, I mean, Sonny Liston can't be Muhammad Ali, you know, I mean, they're both pretty dynamic boxers, but, you know, Ali has one talent, Liston had another talent. And, you know, uh, and luckily, it's not a competition. It's, it's about writing a story that says what you mean. And if you can do that, if you can put your passion into something, you know, somebody said, well, I had this lover. And, and somebody said, well, how smart was she? And I said, well, you know, I wasn't thinking about that. You know what I'm saying? It's not it, <laughs> the the passion you put into it might be greater than the talent that has no passion. You know, it it, it, it it's 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 so difficult uh, to try to to measure those things. You know, to you know break them out and say, well, there's this and there's this and there's that. You know, there's the whole thing. There's you and the story you're telling, and you have to learn how to tell. Sean, what do you think? Jack London. Uh, Jack London once said, I'm not the most original writer in the world, but I'm a hell of an elaborator. And I think <laughs> that goes to that yeah. question. I think, you know, I think hustle beats talent because if hustle never sleeps. And, and to, to, to what Walter said, I was in a writing group one time with a young lady who was just a phenomenal writer. She just, you know, she's just born with a turn of phrase. But like to his point, she stopped writing. She got discouraged early. Me, who was not nearly as good a writer as she was, I was just stubborn. I was, you know, I was kind of pigheaded. It was like, I want to tell this story. And if I have to keep riding up and down the East Coast, going to these live readings and trying to beg somebody to publish my book, I'm going to do it. And that hasn't always served me well in other aspects of my life, my stubbornness. But I think, you know, you can have, okay, you can be Michael Jordan, right? And you just be blessed with God-given talent. But Michael Jordan also practiced a lot. Michael Jordan was all the last guy out of the gym, you know? And so I think talent only gets you so far. You got to hustle. You got to be dedicated. You know, I think those are the, those are the things that really matter. And after you work I, for like 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, that the, your ability as a writer grows. And it, grow, it grows a mm -hmm. lot, you know, as you, as you dig deeper and deeper into yourself. And so, so, the, so the, the idea uh, of you sticking to it is also making you a better writer. You, you'll also mm -hmm. probably be successful. That's my opinion. But uh, it, on top of that success, you will have all of these, you know, this new, uh, these new tools to work with after all those years of writing. So you know, you keep writing. You know, you, you don't worry about talent because there's no way you can do that. You know, but if you're a boxer and you didn't uh, work out for the three weeks before a match. You could very well lose to a much less talented boxer. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. just that you. I mean, and that's just following what Sean is saying. You know, you got to hustle yourself. Yeah, that's what happened. Yeah, speaking of Liston and Ali, that didn't uh, Liston didn't really work. Wasn't really in great shape for one of those fights. And he, you know, if he had landed one of those rights to Ali, it would a whole whole different history, probably. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, I'm looking at questions here. I'm trying to do two things at once. Okay. Uh, uh, day jobs. I'm going to try to, I'm going to recalibrate this question a little bit because we're running out of time, but I know Sean, you wrote, you, you had a lot of crazy day jobs and I know Walter did too along the way. Do you think that's, you know, those nutty different things? 
I mean, I mean, we're all proud of them. Did they make it? Did they add to your abilities? I don't know if they added to my abilities, but they added to my desire to be a writer because I was like, you know, at some at one point I had a job as a hardware store manager. I was one of the managers, and I would go. We had a um, we had a bat, we had a male bathroom and a female bathroom and a unisex bathroom, and I would go in there without the need to use the bathroom, and I would sit on my phone and I would write into the little note app on my phone, and I. I was sitting there one day, I was like, I've got to get out of here. I've got to, I, I got to do something else. And it just, it just drove me to want to be a writer. I was like, I've got to make it out of here. I, I can't see myself doing this for the next 20 years. But also you get, you get stories from that. You know, I love stories. I love, like, I, I, I'm going to move real quick, but I, I do really miss going to bars and out to dinner and the movies, not just because of human interaction, but I love listening to people's conversation, not eavesdropping, but listening to how people talk listening to the rhythm of dialogue, how people have conversations. The, you know, the, the, uh, the comedian Dane Cook said, listen to the nothing argument. You know, you see a couple in a, a supermarket and one of them asked the other one, do we have peanut butter at home? And it becomes this huge thing, this huge argument. It's not about the peanut butter, obviously it's about something else. I love listening to those nuances. And so the, the jobs that I've held gave me those nuances, gave me those, for lack of a better word, insights. Hmm. Yeah. So... You know, when you when you ask about about jobs, I, I've I've hated every job I ever had. That includes working in writers' rooms, you know, in Hollywood, you know, where I'm writing, you know, kind of, you know, I. But, you know, I th I think that you you need to have experience in life. This is one of the problems I when somebody says, you know, at 19 they want to be a writer. Very many writers at 19 are. The only people I know, I, my friend Edwige Dantica, the Haitian writer, she had been through so much shit by the time she was 19 that, you know, she was ready to write. But uh, I, uh, you know, I, I think that you need to have experience. Jobs are one kind of experience. You know, uh, playing chess is one kind of experience. Um, uh, uh, surfing is one kind of experience. You know, there's all kinds of things that we do. The question isn't so much what are you doing, it's it's how that you're taking in. And another thing playing off what Sean was saying, it's how how you experience your life. And when, when the, the, the Dalai Lama was asked by a woman, she said, um, uh, you know, talking about meditation, she asked a lot of questions. She said, well, what do you do about uh, depression? And he said he didn't understand and they went back and forth. And finally he said, oh, oh now I understand. He says, well, yes, when I get depressed, what I do is I experience it. You know, and I think that that's it. You experience your life, and 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 in doing that, you become a a, a better writer or a writer with which much more to fall back upon. At any rate, that's excellent. Uh, I think we're almost out of time, but I, I guess I want to take a second of my own just to say that uh, I love your names. <laughs> I mean, I, I. People, people say to me, well, you know, where do you come up with the names? And I think, I think it's really pretty easy. You just think of a name. What's, what's the big deal? Go on the, go on the phone book. But Walter, I got to say, you are the, you are the world champion namer. Uh, your guys, I mean, starting with easy, uh, which I, you know, I, did, I was reminded that it was Ezekiel was his, his name. So it made a lot more sense then that easy would be his nickname. But I love all your names. Tonight, same with you, Sean, with Lazy, who's a, who's Lazarus, and they, so they start calling him Lazy. So it's yeah. kind of cool because it really is a there's a foundation for it, but it's also got that extra little thing, you know. And you got Sorry, you got Mouse, and all these people. So it's it's a lot of fun. I definitely stole that from Walter. So <laughs> <laughs> I had the feeling, you know, I had a little bit of a feeling that might be derivative. I mean, do you enjoy? Do, do you like doing that, Walter? I mean, do you like? Does the names pop it in your head, or, or how do you how do you go about it? Yeah, no, I love I love I love names, you know, and and I think that you know, especially in America, if you're if you're coming like from you know a southern orientation, uh, or any kind of minority orientation, names and nicknames, you know, they just become the thing. I mean, I you know, people just they they just want to name. They, I call you Kathy, but I you know, but I'm I'm gonna spell it you know with a ch. It's supposed to sound like a K, you know, I mean, it's just like <laughs> there's something that, you know, I'm going to be different. I don't have many things, you know, I can have sex and I can have babies and then I can name those babies, you know, and all that's going to be original. 
And you know, and, yeah. and everything else in my mm -hmm. life, you know, is is uh, is is slogging through. You know, yeah. I, I love names, and uh, and and I think that you know, when you're working with language, you know, all you got is words. Yeah, it's playful, and it's it, it's it's great. I, I, we're, I think we're at eight o'clock, and at this point, I was told that I, you have to I stop. need to, I need to bring Tom Straw if he's. We can wake him up. Come on, oh, Tom. There he is. Where are you, buddy? <laughs> but, but before, yeah, there he is. Hey, but before I go, this has really been an honor. It's been an honor and a privilege, and I enjoyed the hell out of listening to you and talking to you. Thank you. And I hope much. the hell, I hope we can sit at a bar somewhere within the next couple of years because I got a lot more things I want to ask you about. Yeah, we'll have fun. Well, thank you, guys. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. For, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris, and your amazing guests to Walter Mosley and S.A. Cosby. It uh, promised to be a great night, and you uh, brought it for sure. Oh, and uh, by the way, this just in. Congratulations to Mr. Mosley for being given the National Book Foundation's Distinguished Contribution to American Letters last night. Thank you. This is uh, what it's like in Mosley world. His bio grows by the minute. <laughs> So anyway, thanks also to the Mystery Writers of America, New York, Connecticut chapter for putting this on. The Mystery Writers of America is the leading association for professional crime writers in the United States. If uh, you want to be a member, let me give you the web address to find out how. It's ridiculously easy. It's mysterywriters.org. Mystery Writers is one word, mysterywriters.org. At this time, we always thank the Ferguson Library in Stamford for its ongoing support. But for tonight's series finale, I'm going to name names like Library Director Alice Knapp for her enthusiastic support, Susan LaPerla, the Director of Public Service. Thanks to the library's communications and IT departments. You can't do the virtual without them. Also to Elm Street Books in New Canaan, the Ferguson's bookseller. And finally, very big thanks to the Ferguson Library's programming specialist, Barbara Thomas, who's been our guiding force and bright spirit. A reminder that tonight's hour was recorded and it'll be available on YouTube tomorrow. So if you missed any of it, go to the Ferguson Library link. If you miss it, it would be murder. <laughs> on behalf of Chris Knopf and Walter Mosley and S.A. Cosby, thank you all very much and uh, have a good night. Good time. Thanks a lot. Thank you, guys. Good night, guys. Good talking to you. Too. Good night, you too. Good night, Barbara. Good night. Good night.